Good morning, everybody. So um, very excited uh, to have you all here and to do our first uh, Film Academy XR Day. Uh, the history of, of why we do this now uh, is a bit connected to also parts of our audience, of our guests um, that were here yesterday for one of our EU projects, Mike's R. So 30 people were sitting here and discussing uh, the project and its progress uh, and what to do next. And that's why we have Disguise and Foundry and UPF and BBC and crew and everybody here. And we thought it's a great opportunity to also open up what these people do in terms of extended reality to a wider audience. So we have guests, uh, Pixel Cloud and uh, Mac Next um, that took the effort to come here and also share their uh, vision of um, uh, extended reality and um, where, where we are headed at. Um, I personally, I'm really excited uh, about this um, yeah, this mixture of, of different content types, um, XR combining virtual and, and augmented and uh, especially mixed reality. And um, since we uh, have this um, mixed reality set up here with the LED wall and everything, um, we thought it's a good opportunity to invite and bring people together and then discuss. So in the morning, we'll have these input lectures um, and then in the afternoon, everybody is um, uh, capable of, of doing the crew experience. Uh, if you have an appointment, we can try the Pixel Cloud um, um, residential or virtual reality. And we have being uh, an experience that our R&D team created. So um, with that, I would say let's get started with Pixel Cloud and welcome. So hello everybody, my name is Jonas Kirchner, that's Christopher Sulis. Um, I'm founder and managing director of Pixel Cloud. We are a creative agency based in Ludwigsburg and we are developing games, interactive media, web applications and also virtual and augmented reality applications. Um, here you see a lot of our projects. Um, I founded the company 10 years ago during my study at the Film Academy. Ah, here. <laughs> um, I studied interactive media um, and I did my diploma 2014 as a transmedia and games producer. And Christopher Zulis is our creative director and game designer and also concept conceptor. He did a diploma also in Augsburg. Yes, and at multimedia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, also, also here. And I'm a freelance game designer and also uh, a mentor for the expanded realities in Darmstadt now. Yes, we have, we have a different type of clients. On the, uh, on the one hand, we have industrial clients like Siemens or Mercedes or Porsche. And on the other hand, we have a lot of cultural projects. Um, for the TV channel SWR or also for Schlösser and Garten Baden-Württemberg. And now Christoph will show you our history of our latest VR projects we did in the past years. Yeah, we're especially happy to be here at the Film Academy because this is where it all started. So this is like 10 years ago. So there was no Oculus Quest, no Oculus Rift, actually. The development kit was just on the brink. And uh, our colleague, uh, Benjamin Rudolph, where we also do a lot of projects together and also we are uh, involved in that, made uh, self-made VR glasses with actually inside-out tracking at that time. So that was super cool and we Frankensteined it together. And um, also, um, our uh, final um, diploma here um, was Rolling Wild uh, and it ended up in the end to be a VR game actually for the um, Oculus um, Go. Go. <laughs> so, and then also uh, we were here for the VR Now project 
which is uh, a funding for companies, which can also then be here at the um, Film Academy and where we did with a comic artist, a VR experience, where you actually go up one of these uh, elephants. And actually we also made a self-made VR glasses at the time with a Google Tango pad, which you just plucked on a VR headset, um, as a VR headset. And one project um, with both with the SVR TV channel together um, is the Blautopf. Blautopf, it's a lake here, but it's actually also an entrance to a huge cage system. And we actually did a mystery VR game where one of your colleagues, you dive through the lake to the cave system and one of your colleagues gets kidnapped by the low a spirit which is there. So this was very cool because um, the SVR, they didn't want to do a project um, like a guided tour. So they were really in, into innovation and doing some mystery stuff. And uh, we also from the game design wanted to really go with um, gameplay and then even decisions. And uh, also we used the first time um, photogrammetry. That sound. Um, we actually won the German uh, developer uh, um, award, yeah. <laughs> so, and this is our current project um, the, about the beautiful castle here in Ludwigsburg. And I will show a little trailer of that, but talk over it because it's, it's uh, in uh, German. This is a beautiful castle here. Um, you can actually visit it if you look by. So it's a big, beautiful baroque castle. But there are actually a lot of things you cannot visit. And like there's a big, huge mine set. There's also one of the uh, last remaining wooden theaters. Everything uh, burned down, actually, most of them. And so they really wanted to explore what's behind the curtain there. And because these rooms are normally closed, you can now visit them in VR. And especially it was also um, barrier fear for people who are handicapped. Um, and um, you can then proceed nice rooms. But you are one of the, there are two experience actually. It's now that you see this is a photogrammetry process where we took a lot of photos. We also had characters actually. And these are the three experiences you can actually have. So there's a midnight theater. So this is really a story based. You are locked in visitor at night at the castle and you want to go out, come out of it, but you first have to help the ghosts of a time period um, to actually achieve that. Then there's also a normal uh, guided tour where you can hear about the rooms and also have these videos actually, VR videos in 360 degree. So this is also for iPads and also uh, in the glasses. So, so especially this for the barrier free for us was very special because um, we wanted to have that also people who actually cannot move their body, just their head can also enjoy that. And this process was together with a barrier free society. So we actually had really cool test users who were also very excited of VR. And we uh, made two completely different control teams for that. So on one hand, you can use a controller, you can grab stuff, you can um, put the, the, the spices into the chocolate and stuff like that. But on the other hand, you can also just move your head. And if you look long at one of the symbols, it actually will do the action. 
So this was also, and at the same time, you can just always switch between those two things. And what I really liked was when we actually were testing this, um, one of them, he, it was the first time he, he was afraid because there were actually um, stairs. He should go down. <laughs> and for him was just, okay, uh, uh, and he did it. And then he was just so happy because this was su such a cool experience for him to just like, like go through all that and uh, go downstairs again. <laughs> And so this is about the process of photogrammetry. And the blau top, we also did that, but there there was to go down in the blau, we had one hour and a half to go down there to the blau top. So here it was easier. You can just open the door and be in there. But on the other hand, of course, this was, um, this is much more detailed than the blau top. If you have a cave fall, it's much more forgiving. So one of the big parts here was also the um, to retool it to be really good runnable in a 3D engine. Here we see some of the junk. Ah, okay. So this is without lighting. This is like the data we actually get there. And. Yeah, this is again about the guided tour where you have also these symbols and can look at this stuff. So one new thing also for us was the first time we actually had 3D characters. And uh, because we were always with our project, one thing is always one of the newest things. So we built these beautiful characters, but also they were together with a historian. We worked together. So the basis of this were actually paintings. And then they were also in an uh, animation program put up. So we have three characters. So we also have a statue which comes alive. And uh, yeah, this because this is actually also this is a, a trick, trick um, a gadget fountain who was in their time. So in the experience you will find about what it is because this was also a cool place to have wine parties at that time. <laughs> and also an actress. And if you sense here on stage, you actually hear the music, which was composed in the castle. So we really, and the, the, also the scenery becomes alive because this scenery is actually perhaps one or two, or every two years actually can still move the whole scenery. Yeah, so this is about the process where we also tried out how stylized we want the characters to have. And this is the motion capturing. Um, we used a Rococo suit with that. And also um, uh, um, we created um, with an iPhone, all the face movement was actually took and also the sound. So it was really the whole performance got captured. And then it was also um, uh, fi finalized in a 3D project, because the Rococo process is a bit rocky at times. <laughs> so, now we see a little bit of the in-game graphics. So we also expanded the scenery together with the historian to really make a kitchen out of it again. And also every every capture we took care because the actors they don't look always straight at the player. They really say something, they go and then they look. So we really had a time timeline where we always said, okay, no look at the trail, no look at the player. So this was also to enhance the performance that it looks at you like a robot. Das ist doch
And this is actually the, the scene I talked about. And this is still movable, so you can we recreated that actually in uh, in 3D. But also there in the guided tour, you also one of the companies, Lauten, Laut, Lautmacher. <laughs> they were so nice. You need eight people to do that actually <laughs> in the background. So for one time, they also we really did see that in in real life and made um, videos out of that. So, and there's uh, our current project we're working out. It's about climate change, also together with the SVR. And they really want to do something for the generation Fortnite. So these are um, AI-created images. This uh, was in the pitch thing. And it's about an evil company uh, who invites the players to upload the brain to the future to show them how cool the future is if we don't do anything for climate change, actually, because this is an evil company. But in the end, you find out the truth about it and the future is not that bright. Let's put it like that. And it's a multiplayer game. So we are now doing a multiplayer game. And here you see some of the concept arts. Of course, you have a robot body then in the future because your brain gets uploaded into that. And it's a four player game. Yeah. Cool. I think that's it. <laughs> In the afternoon, you can play our um, project here at the left corner. Do you have any questions? Uh, uh, maybe about the cooperation or the contracting with S SWR, which, uh, by the way, for British guests, it's a, a public TV station, the, the South uh, public TV station. Um, uh, can you tell us more about it? And we have numbers on, you know, how many people um, uh, are using it? For, for the uh, Blautopf. Blautopf project? Blautopf, but, uh, yeah. Um, I don't have current members of the project um, but the reason is you you can play it on steam but uh, the problem is it's in German but um, all the people on the world can can play it um, we have players from uh, South Korea also from from uh, Great Britain to put um, a YouTube video from the playthrough it's it's that's very cool so the reviews are very positive and still there are still new YouTube videos which make some playthroughs and it's actually very fun of Korean people or someone playing it and uh, and still get it somehow. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, regarding this climate VR project, um, how is it or how is the balance between uh, info like giving providing informations about the climate change and like all the artistic uh, concept because it's always not that easy right to make it infor uh, uh, entertaining and then on the other side also providing necessary information about the whole issue yeah for us i think in in every project we do we connect um culture uh, gameplay and storytelling so this is like a, a, a line through all the projects even the first project which is self-made VR glasses, still has a, so, so we get used to it. And I think sometimes it's very important that you just, because VR, the, the good thing is, you can actually experience something. Yeah, you can always learn something more, but firsthand experience yourself. So this is for raising an interest and then deepen it. And so with the, the, this project, actually our concept phase was like eight months for the climate change. Um, we heard um, about a lot of researchers and something. Oh my God, this really made me dis depressed actually. <laughs> and how hot the summer was also. So it's a, it's a very hard project. And so we really want to give the player because we, we really talked also to young people and say just some of them, they did that with Greta von Thunberg but now they are kind of frustrated and it's everything is you are the cause of it, telling you CO's why. And so we were really thinking about a storyline where you feel empowered after that and you actually see 
this is also a system change we need to reach. And um, so these packs on the back of the robots, they are e packs. Perhaps we call them air packs because they are renewable energy packs, actually. And so they have solar, you have solar energy and stuff like that. So we put it up into a gameplay mechanic. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's always hard, but it's also um, very cool if people then really get interested in something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, how, how do you work? I mean, uh, so I guess the first one, uh, the castle is like an art commission, a commission, uh, something that's been commissioned to you, and then the climate change thing is an independent type of work. So, how do you commercialize it, or how do you, so how do you pay your bills? <laughs> so. I think you can answer that. <laughs> he has to pay the bills, so. <laughs> Um, there was a, the first idea comes from the TV channel SWR and they made a, a pitch and they um, talked to a lot of agencies or companies um, to, to present the idea of their VR experience, idea for climate change. And then we won the pitch and can do the project. And so it's, uh, but we also really make it our own project. So for the castle project, they had these rooms, they had a loose storyline, which was completely different. And then we kind of really showed them, okay, it, it, they didn't, it was not part of the pitch normally, but we told them, okay, actually, how would it be if you would be a closed in visitor or something like that? And they were just so happy because everything they sort up fall together. And with the SVR, there was no storyline at all. <laughs> so we created something just, just in the, the first, topic. just the topic. So we created something, but I think we were not experts about that. So this was something we first created was much more about your own stuff, CO3. And it was really cool that we were completely involved in that project, talking to the researchers. It felt actually like here again. So really like the content lab we are we're doing here and yeah so this uh, we are a big creative partner always involved in the creative process and also in, involves the customers deeply in it thank you Okay, um, so yeah, we're, we're going to divide this Film Academy presentation, uh, will be divided by uh, the first part, which I will present, and then Simon, our um, principal engineer, will uh, give some insights in one of the projects that you can also experience in the afternoon. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to quickly uh, inform you about um, uh, the two projects that we started in September. Uh, which have their origin in a call from the uh, Horizon Europe uh, project. And it was divided in, um, or the, the Horizon Europe program, which is a big uh, research funding opportunity from the European Commission. So the first one was uh, um, on the development of new modular tools, components, and services addressing media applications. And the second, the launch of a dedicated VR media lab uh, to foster innovation and new solutions in the field of VR and AR media. So this is really the call text. I think what the EU meant was XR. But uh, basically, we were part of consortiums that submitted proposals, and uh, both of them um, got um, accepted. So the first one is the MEXR, uh, Mixed Augmented and Extended Reality Media Pipeline, the project which we had a quarterly meeting yesterday, and some of the guests here are from that project. The other one is the EMIR project, the European Media and Immersion Lab. So I don't want to go too much into detail. This is MEXR, that's the consortium. It's quite big, it's 11 partners, um, and um, uh, it allows us to, to really uh, make sure that during the next three years we can uh, engage deeper into not just virtual production, um, uh, but into a lot of aspects around uh, extended reality. Um, and uh, for the students, you'll, you'll see what that means maybe in a year from now. Um, 
But then uh, the other thing that's really uh, important is the Emil European Media and Immersion Lab. And for that, we just finished a, a trailer that uh, will go online, also the website, uh, in a week from now. Uh, so I'll run this trailer to give you uh, an understanding of what it is. Email. The European Media and Immersion Lab. Sorry, need to increase the volume a bit. Uh, I'm not sure. That's better. Email. The European Media and Immersion Lab is an innovation action co-funded by the European Union, with the UK partner being co-funded by Innovate UK. EMIL is a physical and virtual laboratory infrastructure underpinned by technological and creative expertise and research excellence from four key creative industry regions in Europe, Finland, Germany, Spain and the United Kingdom. The consortium is led by Alto University and includes Film Academy Baden-Württemberg, Universitat Pompeu Fabra and University of Bath. The overall aim of email is to promote innovation and development of next generation XR content, services and applications. Email synergizes the expertise and capabilities of internationally leading institutions, bringing together excellence in narrative media production, smart garments, animation, VFX, embodied interaction, digital cultural heritage, digital health, motion capture and analysis, scientific research and technological development. Email will cultivate a strong relationship with the creative industry community, realised through financial support to third party, FSTP. Project calls designers, game developers, engineers, entrepreneurs, media enterprises, artists, digital fabricators, museum and heritage curators, physical and cognitive caregivers, creative coders, users, citizens and public service media operators. Email will also help foster connections between the creative industry community and other potential innovation partners across Europe. Two open calls will be announced for proposals to be funded in the range of 250,000 to 500,000 euros, with a total budget for third-party projects of 5.6 million euros. Additionally, each email node will create an XR Lighthouse project around its core competence. Smart garments, group-oriented augmented reality, immersive health and exercise and narrative storytelling in XR. Stay up to date with the latest information about email by visiting our website at email-xr.eu and our social media channels and get your proposals ready for email. Extend your reality. Yeah, so the takeaway here really is uh, uh, that there's great funding opportunities and it's not just the money that, uh, that's been distributed through the lab, but um, also lab support in form of facility. Uh, you, you can use parts of, the, of our existing facilities uh, and also the um, uh, teaching structure, for instance, that we have at Film Academy can be involved in, in any of these financial uh, supported third party projects. So, the call will open December 1st. Uh, that video will go live on Tuesday evening, I think. And also the website is still um, is, is in preparation. So um, if you know anybody who has a great XR project and, and seeking funding, point him to Emil XR. And mm -hmm. with that, um, oh yeah, I, I just wanted to mention um, that um, because we also have some some guests from, uh, from the first year, maybe that, um, we had a lot of we have a lot of um, XR equipment distributed in in very different places. So there's uh, some headsets uh, in the IT department, others are in R and D, and we have a treadmill. But where is it? And um, to change that, we we have a room now, um, and we have a person who is associated with it. It's Ed, Edward um, um, Schaefer in the back here, um, and so. Uh, this room isn't big, but we have a place where you can, as a student, you know, where you can go and test things out. There's a lot of content uh, available um, and, and we're slowly building more of an infrastructure to make sure that these things become accessible in a better way than they used to be, where things were a bit distributed. Um, so that's just, uh, it's more like an internal information. Uh, and now uh, Simon is going to tell you a bit about tech uh, of being a nature-inspired immersive VR journey. Thank you, Volker. So yeah, Volker asked me to 
show you some of our latest uh, VR experience. It's not the first we realized within the research project, but this one is uh, basically an outcome of a local funded project, so called Being, because it's all about B, but let's start with the idea. So um, basically it's a customer journey project trying to figure out potential of immersive content within public transportation. So um, therefore we came up with the idea um, uh, of a narrative story uh, um, with um, uh, figuring out the, uh, uh, the um, potential of uh, such an uh, experience to also underline environmental protection and sustainability um, in, uh, uh, yeah, in creating an experience, uh, underlining su such things um, with the claim to prevent an uh, environmental collapse by using public transportation. At the end, uh, it's a three minute uh, train ride where you uh, get miniaturized to a size that you can ride on the back of a bee flying through meadows uh, to uh, sunset. Um, therefore, we started in uh, creating a virtual version of a real uh, train, an S-Bahn train, so to bridge the gap between the real world and the virtual world, you, so you, you will start and end your journey in a, tree, uh, in a train, uh, sitting in a real train, but seeing already a virtual version of it, which then dissolves and then brings you into the virtual world. Therefore, we did quite some research, um, figuring out how to bring the real train track into a virtual world. So therefore we created a small application using uh, a phone here to capture in several rides, position, orientation, acceleration, um, of the real train and use this as a basis to recreate a track in, in our uh, uh, game engine at this point. So we really decided to go for a game engine also to produce pre-rendered footage, uh, which ended up in a quite wild combination of using basically both engines, Unity and, and Unreal. So um, because we wanted to facilitate the high quality, high fidelity, uh, 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 look of uh, uh, Unreal Engine and and have uh, basically the possibilities you have with, with this engine, but at the same time with a target platform of um, mobile devices. So therefore we came up with the idea, okay, we have to pre-render it. Uh, we we pre-render a 360 video, but we try to overcome the limitations of such 360 videos. Um, and therefore, we developed a custom video player in Unity, which has the possibility to um, react on the train's position uh, and speed, basically, um, to compensate for speed changes or orientation. Um, at the same time, you also, of course, have all the nice features of such a game engine, and um, this gave, gave us the, the chance to also have uh, real-time rendered positional audio. Uh, so for the audio, um, we have several components there. We have uh, a synthetic sounds for the ambience. We have uh, uh, organic sounds, uh, which are bound to animals, which are running and flying around. So basically we have three, three types here of sources. Uh, one is the uh, MP Sonics bat for the background uh, sounds. Then uh, a headlock stereo track, which realizes all the effects, whooshes, music, and the bee summing. Uh, uh, sounds and uh, then also real-time rendered uh, animated spatial audio objects, which we basically exported uh, from Unreal Engine, imported it to Unity, and then the player itself is basically a Unity application playing back uh, this video, but can compensate for time changes. And you can also move your head and then in, in real time you will uh, uh, experience a 3D rendered binaural uh, rendered sound which can react to your head position. So um, for our output targets, we also have a video platform version supporting ambisonic sound and of course the uh, Unity player version which you will, or which you can test here in our booth after the uh, presentations. So yeah, that's basically it and
Any questions? Yeah. So do you experience this thing while riding the train or? Yeah, the idea okay. is to, so it's just an exemplary implementation. We just implemented one piece of track between two stops, mm -hmm. which is approximately three minutes. You sit in a train, you can put your glasses on, and as soon as the train starts, you, uh, you experience in synchronized experience, driving in real world experience, all the forces, which are uh, coupled to this, uh, but seeing a completely different world. Uh, but here, we also have a seated version, which, uh, so don't, don't, don't worry, you don't have to go to the train. You can experience it also here in networks also, perfectly fine. All right. Maybe you, Simon, you want to add that um, you know the the speed of the train is then is is measured and and uh, if it's too fast, it's compensated in the video playback to a certain degree, which you don't realize. You know. so it's either played back faster or slower uh, depending on where you are on the track. Yeah, of course you have to do this because not every train ride is, is exactly the same. And actually, we have also the technical director who did all these things, Felix, raise your hand, come on, who's an external guest. Uh... Okay, then uh, our next uh, presentation will be crew. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Um, hello, I am Ishtar. I'm artist and technical director of uh, Crew. Um, I will give a short introduction to um, Crew and then to the work that we'll be presenting later called uh, Delirious Departures. So we are an arts company. Uh, we were founded by Eric Joris, um, who is sitting right there. We are based in Brussels. Um, and Crew has been pioneering uh, XR in different forms since 1998. Um, we approach it very much from a performative uh, point of view. So for us, it's not about making applications, but making performances, so um, theater not on stage, sometimes on stage, um, with uh, different types of media and with immersion as a central theme. Um, we were, so we're very much an arts company. We work generally with public funding. Uh, we're a nonprofit, um, and we're strongly embedded in the research community. Um, which, for example, we are here in the Max R project with uh, Volker and Film Academy. So, um, a work which I did not participate in, which, which I find very inspiring, is uh, Philoctetes. Um, it's a bit old, we don't, ha we don't have much footage, but um, it was a theatre play uh, controlled by a paraplegic person who is central uh, to the stage. People are around him uh, in height, and he controls with his eyes and his prosthesis um, different elements of the stage. So the person has almost no control of his body, but the little control that he has actually drives the entire performance. Um, I think it's a very radical work. I think it was also very difficult um, to put up, but uh, very, very interesting and pioneering. Um, this is Terra Nova. So um, Crew has been a pioneer in uh, VR, um, especially at a time when it was less um, pervaded by consumer technology and develop their own headsets and their own uh, tracking systems for 360 video uh, VR. But this is a theme that we're constantly working on and kind of struggling with. What do you do um, when people are inside the immersion or people are outside of the immersion? How do you play with this, with this mirror effect and this dichotomy? And so in Terra Nova, people would first be outside of the experience and then inside uh, the experience. And everything is uh, done in like a theatrical mise-en-scene, which gives uh, these types of uh, atmospheres and images. So um, an important work, and I think which kind of made the transition uh, for crew to go from 360 video to more uh, 3D-oriented um, VR experiences, is uh, Hamlet's Lunacy from 2019. Um, so it's, we work with art, uh, science, and technology um, on the purely technical side, uh, because we think that technical innovation is a driver for creativity and vice versa. This is an interesting correlation. But we also take uh, science as a theme uh, in our work. So for example, um, I'm going to keep it short, but uh, 
during the time of Hamlet, there's a shift in the way people uh, view society with the Ancien Regime and the newer, uh, newer forms of modernity. And in uh, Hamlet's lunacy, this is connected to the changes that there are in science at the time with the Copernican worldview uh, being challenged and so on. We have a small video of that. I hope it will play. So we, I actually don't have sound, but um, you see, like this is, um, I think this is a very original way of deconstructing the VR experience. So we have an actor in a mocap suit. You have someone in VR. At the same time, there are things uh, being projected, and actually, this is a stage which um, which rides around uh, with the tracking system. So we're actually moving the tracking system, and the actor is very active. He's really manipulating different types of uh, different aspects of the experience. In a, in a very deconstructed way, which offers also with tablets different views of the thematics that you can assign to this time uh, in history, um, perceived to the knowledge of astronomy and Hamlet. So here they're doing uh, uh, a simulation of a star system to understand what exactly are the, the changes proposed in astronomy. I'm not going to play the entire video. So for us, a very important part is um, embodiment. It is, we don't really believe, we don't think the best way to get into immersion is to sit down. The best way to, to into immersion is to walk. You can see this, for example, um, when you have small children coming into a space, they will run into the space and start looking around. This is the way that we appropriate space. By moving around, we create we create a map in our head of the space and we appropriate the space. And this is very important. Um, so to, to, to create that and to make that performative, um, I like to say that we try to not be generic. So from, from a commercial standpoint, it's, it's, it's very logical that you try to make an application uh, that you put in an app store and that you download. I mean, we completely understand it's, it's a very good way of, um, get, of, of exposing what, what you're doing and distributing. But in our experience, VR does not work very well in that sense. I mean, not as good as it could, um, because it's unadapted to what is going on. It's in a way unfit. I don't know if you've worked with uh, VR games, often like the limitations in space and everything make things a bit clumsy. It's, it's very hard to make something which fits for everybody, which is actually logical because it's not adapted to the body, it's not adapted to the person. Some games make you customize it a bit, but it's, um, yeah, it's not, it, it's not an easy thing to do. And another part which is very important to us is VR works very well, um, on, especially on a visual point of view, a bit less on an auditory point of view, and much less on everything else. It's very difficult to do haptics, it's very difficult to do smell, all these things are very important areas of research which do not necessarily have solutions. Um, there are things which we will not be able to solve, I think, I, this is my opinion. Um, so we, there's also a problem with uh, VR virtual mechanics. So for example, if you have virtual objects, you can do some things with them. Um, but we find that it takes a lot of time for people to learn them because they're not actually intuitive. For example, when you hold an object, the center of gravity of the object is here, but you're holding a controller or, or hand tracking and the, and the center of gravity is here. People will not very easily learn how to manipulate this. It's not very natural. And if you have an application, that's not really a problem. But when you're doing a performance, which takes only about uh, 10 minutes with people of all different kinds of ages, uh, this can be an issue. So for us, it's important to adapt to the public. And we also cheat with analog solutions, as I like to call it, um, to include like just very basic means and props for touch and smell and different sensations, which will greatly enhance the sense of immersion. So I already talked about movement and uh, embodiment. Um, so there's also this thing like you can put the most fantastic environment on a headset. Once that people look around for a little bit, the effect is over. Like you have a very short window actually where people are very impressed with what they see. And then, yeah, that's it. And they're waiting for something. It's a very big challenge in VR to keep, to keep this space alive. And this is why we think that performance is the right approach to this medium because you, you, you keep it alive, you keep adding things, you put things in it which are alive and which will keep people engaged. You can change the environment, etc. 
um, which we think works a bit better than game mechanics, because with game mechanics, there, there seems to be a hesitation between I'm somewhere, I need to do somewhere, I need to go somewhere, and for me this is in a way um, immersion breaking. So with all these things learned, um, we started making uh, delirious departures. Um, I will show the video and talk over it, I think. Um, so delirious departures was commissioned uh, by an arts organization in Brussels called Europalia during the pandemic. And so we started uh, scanning railway stations. Um, Belgium has a lot of very interesting railway stations and we um, wanted to do something about it, about the nature of traveling during the pandemic when people are very weird. Um, and so we made something, as you can see, it's very performative. So people are very much uh, into it. It's animated by a live actor. Um, and so the actor controls in which, uh, in which environment you are, and you can, um, you can, he acts as a transitory figure. So putting a live actor inside it makes it very performative. And so he will adapt. So that's what I mean with don't make it bland. People will, the, the actor will make a link with the person in immersion um, so that he always stays inside a live environment. It's never dead. And this is, this is a very um, important aspect. So we have these very impressive uh, images. And so when we were scanning, people were standing perfectly still. And so they became this type of sculpture. Um, and from this on, we started looking at what type of interaction with what kind of human representation uh, can you get inside the virtual reality and how do you relate to that? So um, we make, for example, we have a more, we have a more, let's say, abstract way of approaching spaces and, and, and characters um, because we believe that if you go for photorealism, um, the problem with photorealism is the uncanny valley and people will start to look for differences. And with the avatars that we make, um, we try to more abstract them so that you more are more looking for convergences and similarities to your own experience. And so the actor can animate, can choose his own avatar, um, and um, his, uh, so the way he looks, and see how he can, uh, for example, cheat and find different ways of like disappearing in these sculptures and these different things, or on the contrary, take this shape and appear um, very present in the world so that it's very recognizable. We also try to do um, some type of XR uh, thing. So you saw these images with um, the different uh, pieces of uh, 3D on video. This is a XR setup that we do with a tracked camera, a little bit like a very basic uh, form of XR where we overlay things so that people can also understand it from the outside. So we were in a research project called Present, which helped us a lot with, uh, we have autonomous agents in, uh, in the experience with custom animation systems and things like this, which really helped to make it alive and adds another layer um, of how to interact with digital representations of humans. So yeah, it's, uh, people call it kind of, <laughs> kind of intense. So yeah, so we were, uh, we presented this project at SIGGRAPH in uh, Vancouver um, as an exponent of the present project. So I talked a bit already, so these are the main artistic research uh, points. What's very important for us is that it's an actor's tool. So um, this is again this immediacy. Um, things become very um, plastical if the actor can really inhabit the piece. So we have different actors. With every actor, the piece is different. So um, if you try it today, because we will have a demo later, uh, Hario, our technician, will do the acting. Um, but usually we work with different actors, and they all have their own way of playing the piece. They have a controller, and they can control when you go from one scene to another. As I said, they can control their appearance. And so in this way, they can really, the actors, they love it. They really love it, because they feel super powerful. We had one actor that said, this is amazing, I am God. So uh, they, they can really um, use it as a tool and blend and, and, and work also. They, they, they very quickly learn how to work with the different types of 3D, like for example, to disappear in the 3D and this type of tricks to, to, to make it very expressive. And this adds to this immediacy part that I was um, talking about. 
So practically, it's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, thing. So you have one person in immersion, you have one person uh, who is the actor in a maximum 10 by 10 meter stage with a live mocap uh, suit and so. Uh, I'm gonna show this side. Uh, and then, yes, and so I think this is um, interesting, I think, because I myself and crew as well have been working on real time for such a long time. And it's uh, in a way, it's gratifying to see that now all these real time uh, processes are being applied also in industry because the fact that you can work in real time and also that the tools become easier to use, they really enhance uh, the creative loop. The creative loop becomes much shorter. So for us now with the tools that are available, it is, it's very much possible to make things in a very intuitive way, and then to give it to the actors who can also like make it come alive, which is very different than in the beginning when you just had video playing uh, on a sphere. So um, that makes a big difference for us. Um, so yeah, Delirious Departures for us was an important step, um, but it was not exactly where we wanted to land. We wanted to land further, uh, as everybody wants to. Um, so we're working now on future concepts uh, within the Max R um, within the Max R consortium in what we call in the maybe not so catchy term uh, heterotopic VR. So we want to take the same principles um, but apply them to much larger and complex areas. So now people are doing warehouse VR. We don't necessarily want to do warehouse VR. We want to do things which go through corridors, which go to different spaces with multiple users, so multiplayer and different actors. And the idea is to work on um, the physical and the virtual ambiguity. For example, if we are in this space and you walk through that door, uh, for example, you can be in the desert, but when you come close to that door, that door appears and you can push on it and open it. And this allows for types of immersion which are much, much stronger and which have, uh, we feel that immersion is not an illusion which always has to be 100%. There's a space between, it's, it's a bit like when you're dreaming. When you're dreaming, you say, uh, it, it, it's interesting to say, am I dreaming? This is the moment that you realize that there's something going on. If you're just living the dream, you're not necessarily realizing it. And the same in immersion, it is the time between the physical reality and the virtual reality. It's when you transition in between that actually the most intense uh, experiences happen, in our opinion. Um, so this is the idea to have the special uh, tracking in, in spaces. And then we want to expand it by having different spaces. It's a bit abstract, but we want to have different spaces connected at the same time and have them virtually overlap so that you can beat people uh, and that you can start having ambiguity also between where you are, who you meet, are they really there or in another place, etc. And this for us really expands the possibilities of what we can do. Um, so I'm going to show our partner, ADM, has been working on the tracking system. I'm going to quickly show it because I think it's a very demonstrative video. So it's a prototype. And you see Nick here. So we have these uh, trackers, in, these markers in the thing. And so he sees a different, he sees a virtual representation of the world, a scan. Um, but the real world corresponds exactly. So as I said, there's no need for it to be always, uh, it, it doesn't have to look like, uh, like like this, but you can use elements of this and superpose them in the virtual world and start and start playing with this. And this, uh, this type of tracking uh, for us offers a lot of possibilities because we will be able to go to places, abandoned, abandoned uh, factories and these type of uh, abandoned uh, metro stations and all these type of places which are, which are very um, interesting also for the public who will not be in fear. So this is the type of spaces that we mean. Um, we scanned this in uh, Brussels uh, South. So it's, it's an old um, post, uh, how to say, uh, sorting facility that uh, Hario scanned with 60 scans. And so these are the type of spaces we would like to use and operate in. So that was, my, was our presentation. Uh, we're going to do uh, delirious departures here. It's a bit more limited than when we do it in a more artistic setting because we have little time and little uh, preparation. Uh, but if you book the slots, uh, you can see it. I don't know if there are slots uh, left. Apparently, there are, says Alexa. So there we are. Are there any questions?
Um, thank you so much. Uh, this sounds and looks very, very interesting. I have one question about um, the topic or the way of pretending things, because uh, working in performative settings and in theater, there's always the chance like not to do everything live, but also to pretend that something's happening live. Are you also interested in those kinds of, yeah, imagine this and this is not happening live, but things or is everything kind of uh, really live happening no so we actually so in delirious departures we actually work with liveness on different levels so we have um, sculptures and then we have loops and it's actually interesting because yeah we have a, we have a character which is in a loop sitting down walking away coming back sitting down and the actor is next to it and so you, you get this contrast between the two. We also have AI, which is like, is it live or is it not? We actually work a lot on the question of what is liveness in virtual reality? Because as you say, you can, you can also fake it, you can do different things. And so part of the research that we did was to like, how do you feel towards this, these uh, different aspects um, of it? We find that it's very, very hard to have a real connection with uh, animated avatar. It is. It, it's very difficult, um, but at the same time, there's very easy things which work very well. Um, if you if something looks at you all of a sudden when you come in the neighborhood, then it works very well. For this, we have different types of things which work automatically, but we do try to keep kind of the environments uh, minimal. We don't add particle effects and, 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 and these type of things um, because it's already a lot. Um, you will also see if you go into delirious departures, there are aspects which are visually very complex. Um, but if you make visually very complex things, so this is the thing, in, in virtual reality, your um, intelligence goes down a bit and you are very, uh, you're very easily influenced. So this works, but if you give people a lot of uh, sound and visual information, they will not get anything else. So at some points we actually make everything super bare bones so that you can get, um, so that you can get this impression. So yeah. There's different ways of approaching it, uh, which are specific to the medium. You cannot just apply it for me, like the things that you could do in performance or in theater to VR. It, I don't believe in doing theater in VR, for example. I, I don't think it makes any sense, but uh, yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Well, I have no question, but I can add to that. So in the past, when we were working with this type of video VR, we had a word for that was uh, reality engineering. And so you would be meeting my, uh, me or yourself in VR, and then it is like, uh, oh, you are there? Oh, you are really there? Yes, you are. Oh, you are there, yes. But strange, you said that before. Gosh, this is 20 minutes ago. So that kind of play, which you could well do, is difficult to reproduce in a digital thing, but we are finding ways around it. So that aspect, that kind of, as you explained, that doubt in between of, in the middle of the two, that's the most interesting part. The pure illusion in itself is not interesting, but the, the thing in between. So, am I dreaming? Or so that it's an interesting thing. Yeah, it's also important to note, as Eric said, like there's something, um, like with this uh, 360 video, there's like an immediacy of it that works uh, very well. Like like you. Uh, I call it like the cinematic eye. Um, it's you, you see something, and even if you see that it's not very realistic because it's in the sphere and everything, uh, it kind of works in your brain in a way. Like for example, if you have if if your hand, even if it's not your hand and it moves, you will recognize it. Uh, you will feel like your hand is moving, and you will try to conform to it. In digital, it just doesn't see, really seem to work that way. And we're talking with different people who did studies about this. Like how can we recreate this type of feeling? Because the, the 3D thing is a big step forward, but not in all aspects, I think. At the same time, for people 10 years ago, this 360 video was super impressive, but we evolve and our way of, of, of experiencing media evolves and it just works less well now, for example. So there, you need to constantly seek like different types of things. Yes. Um, not long ago, we, um, we were listening to a presentation of a um, woman who does VR experience for a house, I think in Augsburg, I don't know. Um, yeah, Augsburg, right? And they were really polished, and it was really like to give the the um, spectacle, um, spectators or that usually come during pandemic times, like an alternative experience of theater, of dance, of like, um, yeah. 
the experience, um, but your like your approach is a really alternative one and uh, really like s philosophical, I would say, in a way, um, and just questioning also with like media and uh, and the and the media you use. Uh, have you considered working with houses or was there interest already or like or is it more you do your performance or like um, happenings in turn like with your team and maybe one or two actors and no we do we do collaborations um, the thing is which can be some which is not self-evident like people come people have no experience with VR especially people coming from the theatrical arts and everything they have ideas of what will work in VR. And so basically the first week you work on something, you try out all this stuff and see that it doesn't really work. Um, because what we imagine that works in VR is often, you kind of need to learn how it works. And people, like for example, something very typical that people will try to do, one of the first ideas that they have is like, for example, you're, you're sitting on a chair, you're being interrogated. Uh, and so like with a lamp, so, so that someone's interrogating and someone's sitting and you switch these points of view, which is, which seems a good idea, but the idea that you can change person personality and, and and just adapt, for example, it doesn't work. And this is something p people already uh, always come with. But this changing of the point of view, you're you're not you're too hypnotized in VR to to realize this type of thing. You're in a much more liminal state in a way. Like yeah, so we work with people. Then first after we get uh, through this, and then we are very much of the school. Um, uh, where we put a lot of, uh, as I mentioned, the actors. So we put a lot of um, uh, creative agency in the actors because we feel that actors can be a very good motor for creation, um, which is one of the approaches to theater. Um, so we very much, uh, we don't design the thing and put an actor in it. Like it's really a collaboration between different people and to see what works, what doesn't work, how can we adapt, uh, etc. So this is most of the time how we collaborate. Um, the thing is, like with big houses, um, it's starting to change now. Uh, but when, for example, museum they ask you to do something, they will mostly ask you like, um, how can we put our collection in VR? Uh, which is completely un uninteresting um, because why would I look in VR to flat things like paintings? It, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but we, we're hoping this is changing now. Um, so yeah. And again, uh, if you haven't signed up for a presentation, uh, for, for an experience in the afternoon, you can maybe still do so. Alex, to you, uh, he's giving me thumbs up. Um, uh, and our next guests are from uh, Magnex and the Europa Park, and I'll prepare their presentation. Ah, you can come. So Oliver Siedvogel and Matisse Goulon are our guests, and uh, we're looking forward to what you will be presenting. To sell your videos in the Explorer, right? And uh, to full screen. All right, thanks. Um, so, hello everyone, um, very happy to be here. Um, so, um, yeah, I have to say first, uh, we've been pretty impressed with what we've seen so far and pretty humbled to be here uh, to talk to you about Shulby, which is, um, yeah, as you discover, um, um, an experience uh, at Europa Park, so um, quite um, not far from here. Um, a different approach from what we've seen from you guys, but I think it's pretty interesting to yeah, compare what we've got in common and, and see the differences. Um, before we go too much into details, I think a quite quick introduction is, uh, is needed. So my name is Matisse. Um, 
I'm most of all a theme park specialist. Um, been visiting over 200 parks in the world and just really passionate about theme parks. And I've been working on VR since two years now. Um, and Olivier will, will introduce himself. Thank you. Uh, thanks for listening. Welcome. So my name is Olivier Tietvogel. As you can listen, I'm French. So I started in VR in, back in 2007 in the French uh, National uh, Research Center, where uh, we were trying to understand how the brain encodes the space. Like with proximal elements, with distal elements, how do you map your space into the brain? How you, do you perceive uh, everything? And uh, then after that, in 2014, 13, I backed uh, uh, Oculus and I started my own company. And then I joined Europa Park two years ago on the Yulbi project, which is basically in the digital and entertainment department, everything using augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality, whatever reality, as long as it uses digital devices. So now we are talking today about uh, our product you'll be and also uh, different contents we are going to release at Europa Park in Roost and you're more than welcome to come. Um, so yeah, before we start, um, I think the main difference is that we arrive at a park which is already existing. We've got 6 million visitors per year, so you'll be a new part of the park and it's not something we can create from scratch. So we had to adapt to this reality. Um, the, the basis of thinking was from Michael Mack, which is our CEO, was to say, OK, we've got people staying more than one day now on average. It's close to two days now, so we need to have them do something at night. And in Rus, which is the small village we're in, I'm sorry, they're just restaurants and I think that's all. So we needed, we needed some offer at night. Um, and Yulbi was the first milestone, the first part of it to say, OK, let's bring people into a small space and bring them an additional layer of story, let's say, uh, by doing some VR experiences um, during the evenings. And you've probably heard, uh, so that's called a digital village. I don't know if you named it. Uh, for the ones who have visited already Disneyland uh, in, in Paris, they also are experimenting that kind of stuff. So basically, it's for the people that do not pay for the day long, but they can come by night or any time. And it's a per attraction uh, basis payment, right? So now we have Yulbi, but we also have yeah. just recently opened, you may have understood, uh, uh, heard about the Restaurant der Zukunft called Itrenaline which is based uh, on the uh, Paul Perez, uh, Shanghai uh, uh, augmented reality restaurant where you have, uh, you know, a mix between visual uh, uh, um, smell and, uh, and also uh, uh, eating and uh, you're on uh, small ve vehicles, kind small of. vehicles, we yeah. can disclose yeah. that, that are based on robotics and LiDAR technologies. Exactly. Ah, that's my turn. So basically, we have uh, now we roll back to Yulbi. We have uh, created, uh, you know, we are building attractions. So we also, like you guys, uh, do a, uh, a lot of R and D, etc. But at some point, we have to bring that to something that gets industrial, that gets measurable, and that makes money, right? So how did we approach VR? We said, okay, there is, I would say, two big families. The big family that is on simulation, so it's full body tracking uh, with all of, of the haptics, uh, big scale uh, uh, places, etc. group interaction. But that's quite, if you put that in an attraction, that starts to get rather expensive. But we have it, it's called You'll Be Pro. It exists in Roost, uh, in Europa Park. And we also have an installation in Miniature Wonderland. So it's based on full body tracking, 250 square meter tracking space using Vicon technology. Uh, we are moving to other technologies, but at the time we started that, uh, that was the only thing available. We have uh, five points of tracking. Um, so the feet, the, the hands, at least the arms, and the body. Um, we have a, a group uh, work. It's a 30 minutes experience. So basically, you have to wait for uh, uh, the first group to have finished in order to enter. But because we are theme park based, we want to optimize the space. So the cool thing with ULB is that we have a throughput of uh, more than uh, 64 people per hour because each group of eight, once they enter the room, they go to a second area and they will never come back to this first area. So that was the way to use a big space, but to split it into four uh, subspaces. And then we have uh, a ULB uh, Go that is basically just Simple headsets taken from the market right now uh, without any, any advertisement. We are using the Vive Focus 3 uh, because they are made for uh, location-based entertainment. They have replaceable batteries and stuff like that. 
And we use just them with the existing controllers. We set up a room of 80 square meter uh, with the you know, inside out tracking, no haptics. And uh, again, uh, you can have a little experience. The big difference for the customer is that the first one, you need to be a group. So it's a long experience, 30 minutes. And the second one is like a hop in about 10 minutes, a uh, very, very quick experience, but that does not need uh, all this, uh, this hardware. Yeah. Quickly, yeah, the hardware, uh, we can speak a lot, but I, I think most of the people here are into the VR industry. And we will look a little bit later in the presentation where we are going, so from where we are today and where we are going uh, tomorrow. Yeah, just to, before we transition, here is one of our new haptics that we've been ah, developing yeah. in-house. Um, this one is a gun. Um, yeah, and we've been developing different kind of kind of assets. Yeah, not something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. So yeah, one thing that is very important is that because we are, uh, you know, it's not only Europa Park. We have uh, MacRide, which is a mechanical company. We have VR Costa. We have different. Uh, sorry, we have different um, companies into the group. So we are able to produce everything internally. So where some companies need to use external companies to create haptics, we can do them uh, ourselves. And for the next content, we are going to release. Uh, for the Orea Awards, for the ones we come, and for the next uh, uh, beginning of the year, we have developed, we can disclose that, uh, a full featured, uh, a full uh, tracked uh, gun for uh, VR. There are a lot of guns existing, but here we have designed one that is very smaller and has a, a perfect feedback uh, uh, um, uh, elements, etc. But we also have uh, developed um, elements that you can touch, buttons that you can turn. I know in the previous presentation it was discussed how much, you know, uh, with this new mapping from VR to real reality, that's a very uh, important uh, problem uh, that we have not totally solved because we don't have the finger tracking. But you totally imagine that when you want to press a button, you want the finger to be uh, to be perfectly done. So by inverted kinematics and by taking big buttons for kids. It works, but again, uh, this is also something we want uh, to work on. So yes, haptical elements, I know it was discussed. You know, we always say VR immersion is half uh, video, half visuals, but the haptics maybe is the, we have to divide by three. Huh? So it's a third video, a third uh, sound, and a third uh, of the haptics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, pretty quick, I don't think we need too much explanation on this, but for us, it's always important to get the state of the industry. Um, at least for us in theme parks, in the amazement, I would say the amazement phase is done. Everyone has tried VR, everyone had fun doing a basic coaster content, so now it's done. Um, in terms of tracking technologies, we see now some new interesting things. We've been testing here on site um, a technology that doesn't need any capture, uh, anything. So it's just like a few cameras and just AI uh, that allows for really perfect tracking. So it was pretty impressive for us and we are maybe looking forward to, yeah, to, to work with them one day. Um, yeah, then I won't talk about big industries, you know it already, and in the theme parks, which is my world kind of, um, yeah, let's say, all, again, the basic VR phase is over, but now we've got some bigger players trying AR, especially in, in uh, attractions. It's still very fragile, but I think it's the way it's going to go uh, in the years to come. So, a little bit, what are the trends now, right? So, we have explained a little bit uh, where we are, but now where, where do we believe we go? Um, You'll be pro right now is based on backpacks, right? We all know that HP has discontinued the backpacks. We all know that it's a complex issue because it's heavy, etc. And our current you'll be go, uh, sorry, you'll be pro setup. So the full body haptic one is based on this backpack. We even had customized a Pimax set set, uh, you know, with a big shell, etc. And for sure, this is uh, very heavy, especially for uh, the weaker persons, etc. Uh, it's still a 16 plus experience, but you know, uh, uh, we also want to think that maybe we can go a little bit lower in the age group, maybe 14, maybe 13. If we look at the disclaimer of Oculus, we can go, I think, starting from 13. So more or less, uh, uh, we, we believe that in the entertainment, in the location-based entertainment, it's not possible anymore to think about having uh, a backpack, but anyway, it's discontinued. So we are moving, and for the next uh, experience we are releasing, it's called Ember Blake, uh, we have moved uh, to uh, 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 embedded headsets. Again, we are, have this, this uh, HTC. The problem is that when you go into these headsets, we all know that the graphical quality goes lower. 
because the manufacturers have decided to uh, still have these two uh, rabbits to chase, the desktop computers and the embedded uh, things. I think the market is going to change a little bit, especially with Apple now uh, also playing with this uh, mix between embedded and uh, non-embedded uh, GPUs and CPUs. But let's see where the market goes. So we are thinking about the streaming. You know, you have uh, people into uh, a room, you can have a render farm, either it's on the cloud or it's on on-premise, and you can stream the, the graphics. The problem right now we are facing is the number of users we can stream at the same time. And because we are a theme park and the spice have to, has to flow like in June, we have to have a throughput because we need to make money. And the problem right now is that with the limitation of Wi-Fi 6, we cannot reach 32 people at the same time. It's not possible. Or we have really, really to get rid of the, of the quality and then compress and then come back to the problem we have uh, with embedded. So we are looking also with different partners, with Vodafone, with, uh, to look into the 5G, uh, uh, I would say, solution. 5G can be an option. The problem is that with 5G, you cannot roll that out in every country. I'm French, forbidden. In Germany, yes, in Thailand, uh, yes, but in Taiwan, yes, but some countries do not allow to use the 5G uh, as a private band without having a billion dollars license to be paid. So still a little bit something we are, we are looking for to have a massive number of uh, users. But again, the streaming is probably the future. And for the ones who know a little bit the, the graphical, the game industry, you know, there was always a, a fight between integration and uh, uh, externalization, you know, big systems and terminals versus embedded and uh, uh, everything in-house. So we believe it's the time for streaming. Sorry. Uh, then also what is very important right now, we don't do it, but we believe it's very important to be yourself in VR. Uh, so it's cool to have an avatar, to play a rabbit, etc. But at some point, especially, especially in group work, we believe it's very important that people get a chance to have a little bit of themselves into this VR version of themselves. So avatarization, uh, it's important, we believe on that. And we are working with different companies to have something very quick, like a photo booth, where you go inside, you get scanned, and then we take part of uh, maybe your face or your corpulence uh, or your body shape, whatever, uh, into the, into the, the virtual uh, world. Um, we are also looking into volumetric capturing. The previous presentation mentioned that. It's very important thinking about photorealism. I remember the first presentation was also uh, doing a photogrammetry in this beautiful castle. Uh, we believe also that's very important and especially for the casual users, which have always the sense that they did when they do VR, it looks like a video game. Uh, and for us, it looks like a video game of the 1990s, right? So, so the people who are not uh, players, who are not open or used to do uh, gaming, they have an issue with that because it, look like, it looks like a cartoon. So going into photorealism uh, and volumetric capture, we believe it's very important. So that's also something we are working on. And for sure, AI, because it's a hot topic, we are also using AI in order to optimize the space because you all know that when you have 250 square meter, you want to use that in the optical space a little bit bigger. It doesn't in the optical space is only 250. So we also have some models into the prediction of the movement of the people in order to reuse the physical space uh, 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 in multiple different optical space. And uh, we even made it harder in the new content because we have two groups splitting into the same uh, physical space. So we uh, try always to push the things further. As I said, haptics, very important. We are designing, thanks to MacRite, uh, a lot of uh, elements. Uh, without too much disclosing, we have designed a new effect floor that will use a gravity effect. You know, most of the floors in VR are based on vibration. Here we have something that really creates G-force. Hopefully we don't use it too, uh, into the, to the maximum rate because uh, there can be some issues with the tube. But uh, we have uh, this uh, first uh, of the world uh, effect of uh, really gravity um, in, in VR, as far as I know. Um, body tracking, we need to go further into that because the whole expression of the body right now, you know, with inverted kinematics, whatever the, the, the tracking points gets a little bit tricky. Uh, I don't believe in this uh, um, infrared approach by Kern, OptiTrack, etc. This is the old world. I really believe in pure visionics based on 
you know, high definition cameras. And as Matisse explained, uh, we had some contacts with different companies, especially based in Israel, which are doing uh, body capture based uh, with cameras. So two, three, four cameras looking at a crowd and you get the full skeleton with the fingers. Uh, it's pretty, pretty uh, amazing. Uh, we tried also with obfuscation, etc. Uh, we are very amazed by that and we believe this is something we will put in place in our VR attractions, but maybe also into a more uh, a wider uh, theme park uh, experience. And last but not least, it, I go to this wider experience. We call that the magic ones. But the whole idea is that when you have a theme park like Europa Park and you have these six million people every year coming up, doing the queuing, etc., eating uh, ice creams and food, mm, the waiting time is still a lot. So it's part of the experience. Going to a ride in five seconds, you would not have the same momentum. But we still believe that there is something we can give to the users during these waiting times. And because the park is a fantastic level design as such, so you don't need to recreate a new, a new level. The park is already uh, like a Super Mario, you know, with the sand area, with the whatever, uh, you know, British area, Irish area, etc. Why don't we use all these parks as a, a unique game, thinking a little bit about Pokemon Go, you know, this chasing hunt stuff, etc. And they are for sure tracking systems at the wide range plus augmented reality device to increase the perception of the real world should be, uh, should be the key. So we are also looking into that. Sorry for being a little bit long. That's all right. Yeah. Um, so I'll compress the rest. Here is one, uh, the, the next content we're going to do, which is Ember Black VR. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to um, uh, be released end of January. Um, so yeah, it's been basically 15 months of work for a lot of people. We've been working with Mac Animation to do a lot of animations. And for us, it's a big project. It's the first time we do such a big project. So yeah, I won't go into details, but this is basically some game design documents some gray boxing, some, um, some uh, concept art. So you basically know all of this world. Uh, we've been doing some characters, of course, um, with some nice textures that you see. We've been doing some animations, as I just said. Uh, these are our three main characters. And yeah, you just know the process, but uh, for us, it's a pretty new thing. So we're pretty proud and happy that we can jump into this world. Um, and yeah, so what I want to say in maybe in three, let's say, big lessons for us, at least, um, we try to do things smooth and elegant. It's not so easy when you come from the world of theme parks, where it's mainly sometimes cliches or, or still classic things. So we try really to work on how smooth can a VR content be. And it's so not so as easy as it, as it seems. Um, second thing is we really try to put our guests as creators somehow, um, because we, we, we often say we are the host. We've got the playground and people can do whatever they want, but we really also need to apply this to VR content. How can people actually do what they want and not just go through a path? This is really important. And the third thing, the biggest challenge for us is to see how we bridge the, the gener generation somehow, because we've got some new generations, they want to be active to have some action, and you've got the oldest one that just want to be, then see, see some nice things. So how do you make sure that somehow, the, let's say, the passive and active uh, uh, people kind of have fun together uh, somehow, um, and and yeah, just just uh, enjoy the same thing, the same emotions inside the same content. So this is for us, let's say, the biggest challenge um, for now. Yeah, that's the big thing, uh, and that's a little bit why we we called our presentation bridging realities and the Padawan, etc. Uh, it's very important that, you know, me coming up from, you know, the VR industry, whatever engineer, etc., and Matisse being a simple architect, etc., it's very important that we keep, you know, what's good in both worlds, etc., and that we bridge that uh, correctly. Because, you know, um, we have experimented since 2015 VR already into the park. We've put the first of the world VR on coasters, etc. Yes, okay, it's working, but at some point you need, uh, you know, you need to renew, etc. And the uh, the whole theme park industry is also evolving. So it's very important that we, uh, you know, understand this and move together into, you know, probably a digital twin. We are thinking about all this stuff, you know, what do you do at home? How the theme park can come to your home, etc. And how from, from the, theme park, the theme park you can go to someone's home, etc. Uh, we have seen some people doing Minecraft uh, copy of Europa Park. It's, it's amazing, it's mind-blowing, but it's not connected yet to the park, so we are looking into that. And basically, to conclude, you know, uh, uh, we, what is the theme park of tomorrow is, is a mix of a little bit of this uh, trick pyramid, uh, but at the end, the, 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 the most important stuff is fun and emotion. That's why people go to theme park, apart from 
eating, they come to get thrilled, they get to get fun, etc. And all of that uh, needs to be uh, augmented with technology and different uh, uh, elements that we uh, discussed uh, a little bit already too long, I think. So maybe it's time for questions. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, so your business model for theme parks is very clear, of course, but then the other part was you were making something for hotels and things like that. So how does that work? Because this cannot be very, uh, this must be very difficult. So there needs to be, to be someone to, to help you with the technology, maybe someone to help. Then you need to have a continuous stream of people going in. So how do you make that work? So, 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 um, First of all, it has to be looked uh, from, I would say, an upper scale. We have a, a land. We have a huge land, right? One land is a theme park, right? In order to have people in the theme park, you need to have amenities around, right? So we have, to, we have created uh, seven hotels and probably new there. The problem is that the flow of people goes in the morning into the theme park and in the evening goes back to the hotels. And there, from there, you have a part of the people that do not have activities to do because the park is closed. Sorry? Exactly, exactly. It's into the area. The only difference, maybe I wasn't clear, is that there is the theme park, a prison, <laughs> and there is the outside. And there are now attractions outside, and that's called usually a digital village or a village, whatever, because then it's a free. Even people from uh, the village can come. Even people from just two hours can come, etc. They don't need to spend the whole day in the theme park. And uh, yeah, that's uh, quite a certain amount of people. Um, thank you. How do you deal with those kind of restrictions, the hardware, for example, the, the Oculus or Meta devices or HTCs um, have? Because I know many artists, I'm also from theater, struggling with all those uh, yeah, information provided by the... This is for me, yeah. Sorry. Um, do you know the story of Super Mario Bros? Okay. No, which one? That the first, the first... Uh, the, the the platform game. So, you know, to make it short, technological restrictions, if you understand well, can be a source of creation. You know, that's how I see things. So yes, we are restricted in graphics, etc. But that's where sometimes you could, you know, at the time people were using cell shading and everybody was saying, oh my God, it's beautiful to see a cartoon moving, etc. Far from photorealism, etc. Uh, technically, yes, uh, I mean, it's boring, etc. We have to live with it. The streaming is an option, but that's a technical option. But I really, until we have the streaming in place, I really believe from there we need to uh, find uh, original ideas. And usually, I, I believe it's creation. And in Mario, that's the story of the hat. Mario would never have his hat if they wouldn't have an, uh, an issue to really limit the pixels with the limited number of pixels so that you get the knock on the block. That's the story of the hat. And they did Mario Galaxy in order to celebrate the fact that Mario uh, had a hat just for a technical reason. I don't know if I answered. <laughs> Okay, and special channels to talk to the company? For sure, for sure. That's the key. That's the key. And we are, you know, and I don't like to say that we are a big company, so it makes things a little bit easier because the amount of headsets we are going to buy is easier. That said, to be totally transparent, Oculus so far had a very limited B2B strategy. And that's why we are also working with HTC because HTC is fully B2B. So HTC is doing that because they don't believe they can compete in the B2C segment, and they are totally open to discuss, as long as you buy headsets, uh, uh, to modify the firmware up to a certain limit. Uh, you have Pico. Uh, Pico is another company. They are fully open for modification. Up to a point, the stability can be discussed afterwards. But yes, uh, we have to find a good trade-off between being able to address these problems with the manufacturers without uh, creating our own headset, because that's not our... our, our our objective, I would say. But yes, we have uh, direct contact uh, with them. But again, HTC more flexible than Oculus, for sure. Yeah. A purely practical question. So your experience with backpacks so far, how was that? 
horrible. <laughs> I mean, to be clear, yeah, maybe yeah. you no, yeah, to say something no, a little no, bit. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. The, the, the capacity we have, um, which means yeah, 60 people per hour every day um, for, um, for every day of the week. Um, of course, the hardware just doesn't follow it. It's, I think it wasn't made for this. We are one of the largest, at least. Um, fleet of the world. Uh, we have like world. So, 70, now 120 backpacks. I think, again, it creates more problem, at least from what we've seen, that it has solved. So um, uh, it's been a difficult experience, to say the least. Uh, the COVID hasn't helped. We just launched before COVID. So all the hardware f uh, worked for two months, then was down for a few months. It was also not easy. Um, so again, I think for, for smaller installations or more temporary installations, it makes sense maybe to, 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 to use backpacks to, if you want to, really to focus on the quality of content. But for us, at a large scale, I think really mobile is, uh, is no discussion anymore. Yeah, uh, I think your, your spot on uh, question is how industrial your product has to be and uh, why HP stopped the backpacks because they could, it's not an industrial product. It's simple. I mean, the factory, I even visited it. It's really ridiculous. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not a massive product. So it has not the, the strengths uh, of, of any... Uh, so it was uh, planned in advance. They knew it and they were, they were losing a lot of money. So now you have some manufacturers, I think uh, Schenker even is doing one, etc. Zotac as well, yeah. Zotac were already from the beginning into the... But Zotac, I think, is Schenker, if I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. So yeah, they're coming with something. Why not? But for us, again, it's also the heaviness. Uh, and anyway, uh, if you have a fleet of 140 backpacks, imagine how many people you need to maintain them. You know, when a, a mobile headset is, 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 is crashed, you just replace it. So the cost, unfortunately, of human resource is higher than the hardware cost. And anyway, so we cannot uh, uh, continue with HP. And moving to another, that was a question, huh, really. But that, I don't believe, is the future anyway, so... Yeah, we're also looking at streaming. How, like, we're looking at the limitations of it. How many people do you think will... will... So you can do the calculation. Uh, <laughs> we think I think we think 70 megabits should be more or less the kind of a standard. So then you can divide. With Wi-Fi 6, I think you can reach 12, maybe. Yes. Yeah, we were looking at 6. Seem to be I think you got, then if you compress a little bit within 264, 5. Yes. Um, the problem is that we need to reach 32. So we are just out of the range anyway. Uh, but again, with 5G, you can do something because 5G has um, totally another family of protocols, etc. Uh, so it can work. We got the guarantee and the proposal. So that's something to be feasible. The problem is the cost uh, uh, because 5G is uh, very expensive. Um, and also the problem of what do we do in countries that do not allow to play with these uh, private bands. And there, because, you know, the park is creating attractions, but sells them uh, all around the world. So it's a big investment for something we may not be able to sell, you know. So maybe as a luxury car, as a super super installation in Roost or in Germany or in the country, yes. But as a the, the business model is discussable right now. But again, it, this will be fixed in the next uh, years. And, uh, I, I have no doubt that the streaming. And if you look at Nvidia, what they are doing with Amazon, etc., they are clearly on this on this thing. And for the ones who have maybe seen the first Oculus presented at the CES, they had a big column, it was full of machines. So the image they were showing with the, the what do you call that, the prehistoric monster, or the, the raptor or whatever, and so it was like, it was calculated by a, a random farm. So it's, you see where, where we were already at the beginning into you know, non-embedded uh, computing for sure. Yeah, yeah if there's no more question, um... I just want to say thanks and come up with an invitation for um, everybody from Film Academy, staff, alumni or student. We have a co cooperation of Film Academy with these guys, with the Europa Park, with Mark Next. And um, we thought about bringing you to Europa Park. Um, and if you want to try out and actually get some more into the details, um, yeah, then send an email to, to my address, christian.muller at Film Academy, and yeah, everybody in the room is invited. I will not write an email to um, the student list because I think um, it's great that, that you joined the, the session today. And um, yeah, so if you want to get deeper into this topic, um, write me an email and um, then we get a car, a bus or whatever and drive over to Wurst. And um, then we get to see much, much more. 
Hello, yeah. we're more than welcome Thanks. to do a, a presentation on site. Uh, if you have more technical questions and if you want to see uh, how you bring a VR experience to, I would say, an industrial level, which runs uh, all the day long. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for these insights. Uh, I, I, I'll i join uh, if, if somebody from the students wants to go. Somebody has to come with you, right? So uh, I'll do it. Um, uh, so the next guest, and that's the final presentation for the morning input lectures are from the company Disguise, Sarah Coppola and Dom Brown is in the back. And um, you have your own, you will take over the screen now. Right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually, I'll take over the screen. <laughs> All right. Um, you want to? We, no, no, I don't want this. I, I'm loud. I don't. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm loud. <laughs> loud enough. See? The camera would love it. Oh no, that's fine. Oh, wow. the, this is our show reel, so you see, you see who they are. Who we are. I'm sure that everybody knows who this guy is. If you don't, I'm going to tell you a story, which is why I'm not slides, because this I can't actually write on a slide. About 20 years ago, there was a group of technologists, a group of friends, and they believed they could do something that had never been done before with a technology that they created, and they wanted to do it on massive screens, and they wanted to do it on real time. Absolutely mad. Well, word of mouth got in the way. They got approached by a show producer who said, why don't you come and do it to my show? Well, that show turned out to be Massive Attack. And that's how these guys was born. Since then, for 20 years, we've been doing incredible visuals for live performances, for U2, for Coldplay, and many other big names. And Four or five years ago, the company started looking at extended reality. Why? Because we had a real-time system, so we knew already that we could deliver visuals in real time. And what we needed to do was just looking at how do you deliver this to different industry? So what is extended reality? What is virtual production and so on? And that's how they com the company pivoted the business, and now we touch every um, industry that has anything to do with extended reality. We have 12 offices around the world, count of over 350 people right now and more, and we do a lot of innovations. I'm the head of research program, and Dominic, that is our very own Doc Brown, in the background playing cool things on the stage behind me, is going to come over here and give us all the technical details about um, our technology. And you're coming with a computer, I'm oh, sorry, I just, I just do a here. Um, cool, yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Don. Uh, I'm on the research team at Disguise, and usually I'm in the basement writing code, and they've let me out today to talk to you all, so it's all very exciting. Um, so yeah, so, uh, you don't know whether there was any sound on that video, but um, yeah, so we're from Disguise, which uh, um, our bag is all about kind of real-time, um, graphics and you know, video playback and things like that. So yeah, we kind of originally started in the early 2000s um, doing gigs for Massive Attack, uh, U2, um, all these kind of like big live events. If you've ever watched Eurovision, you've watched content that's been played on our technology. Um, you know, and some of the, the World Cup, we're doing lots of the World Cup coverage at the moment um, in the kind of the broadcast space. Um, and yeah, about two years ago, uh, something happened that meant no live events could take place. Um, and kind of, you know, as a company, we pivoted into doing sort of um, uh, virtual production. So yeah, um, so yeah, so for instance, okay, so um, scenario, you want to go and film in the Australian outback. Uh, you've got kind of three options. You can fly everyone out to the Australian outback and um, do some filming there. Um, you can use a green screen and then put the Australian outback um, behind your actors in post-production or you can use LED volumes like this uh, and film everything um, in camera. And the whole point about you know, virtual production is being able to um, capture all of the content in the camera and it's, you know, it's captured there and you don't need to do much things in, in post-production. Um, and what are the real benefits to this? Um, in my opinion, one of the big benefits is you know, light and reflectance. There's a reason we have um, LED screens on the roof and it's this ability to basically capture a, like a high dynamic range um, image, you know, uh, like you would do in a uh, graphics engine, and being able to do that like on real people. I mean, there's a reason why um, Star Wars Mandalorian used it. Um, the guy was walking around in a big chrome suit, 
And if you're walking around in a big chrome suit or if you've got a car or some other really reflective object um, or a space helmet or something, um, and you're using a green screen, it's like one of the most annoying things in the world is to go in into that set and comp out all of the green that gets reflected off your highly reflective suit and replace it with virtual content. But when you're using an XR stage like this, um, you capture all of that light bouncing correctly. You know, the correct light, the right greens and the right oranges of the Australian outback will reflect off your chrome suit um, and be captured into the camera. And it kind of, you know, speeds up production in a big way and saves a lot of work in, in post-production. You look great in Australia, Doc. Thank you. Yeah, just for the weather. Um, so yeah, so how, how is it done? So all of this is being um, rendered in real time. Um, and you'd usually have a camera. So I don't know whether this camera's being tracked or not at the moment. Um, but what you'd do is you'd basically um, do some maths to uh, make sure that all the content from the perspective of the camera um, is correct. Uh, so that it might look a bit warped on, this, on the screens, but from the perspective of the camera, um, you get a correct kind of image. And as you're moving the camera around, we, in real time, update the content that's going up on the screens. And um, we'll have a bit of a demo later on. Um, and I really rec uh, recommend coming and having a play around, moving cameras around, and, and getting a better sense of the, of the system. Um, and then, yeah, it sort of like have, has to have quite a bit of a calibration process to make sure that your understanding of the virtual world um, is lining up with your um, understanding of the physical world. Um, so, yeah, so what's, uh, what's really good about like, the sky system is um, what we do is we decouple um, the kind of the rendering side from the compositing side. So obviously, like, you have to output stuff to the LED screens. Um, and you have to kind of render live content. And in a lot of systems, like for like a standard like Unreal system, um, you're kind of a bit like you have to, um, you know, it's, sometimes it can be a bit like one server per screen or something like that. Whereas we have this flexibility of, OK, you want a really, really detailed scene, and you want to um, render loads of really complicated content, um, then we can give you like 10 render nodes. Uh, and you're only outputting to like say one LED screen. You can have 10 render nodes and one sort of VX or compositing machine. Um, or you know if you've got loads and loads of LEDs, but you have very very simple content that you don't need much rendering power for, um, then you can go the opposite way. You can have lots of compositing nodes and very few render nodes, and the whole system works to um, make sure that everything's up to date, everything's synced up, and all the content's being projected where it needs to be. Uh, so it's very very flexible, um, and it also has this element of interoperability. So one of the things that we pride ourselves at Disguise is that we have basically like day one support for any kind of new rendering engine. So when Unreal Engine 5 is, was released, 24 hours later, we updated our plugin, and you can use Unreal Engine 5 on a Disguise system. Unreal, Unreal Engine 5.1 is released. Um, the day later, we've updated all our plugins, and you can use Unreal Engine 5.1 with your you know, Disguise system. And it's not just Unreal Engine. Um, we can use Unity, Notch, or even you know, your own custom-built um, OpenGL rendering engines. And you can all sort of switch between them very, very quickly. So it's incredibly like you could have one scene being done in Unreal Engine, hit a button in the software, next scene's in Unity, and you can carry on going. You don't have to you know, unload everything, load everything back up again, switch again, you're in Notch, or switch again, you're in you know, uh, 2D rendered play content or anything like that. So it's incredibly like, uh, flexible. You can um, switch around very quickly. Um, and yeah, it's got this very like out of the box calibration process. Like setting up an XR stage can take a lot of time. Uh, one of the things that we pride ourselves in is that we have all these calibration tools that let you get up and going really quickly, um, and saving a lot of time on set. You know, like going onto a film set is very expensive, um, and if you're spending days and days calibrating your system, um, you know, it's a big waste of money. Whereas on our system, you can calibrate very very quickly and get up and running um, very quickly. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's basically uh, it. Does anyone have any kind of questions for in terms of this guy system? Yes. Uh, no, so this is um, this is being rendered. This is yeah, this is a second pass, and we've done it in. So this is at like a lower resolution because you don't need as because you're not filming against it. You don't need it to be high resolution. So you take the average more or less uh, per image of this, and you, you 
No, no, it's just this, it's this scene, but mapped to, um, but like for the camera position being kind of faced upwards. So you've got like, in this particular scene here, there'll be like a, a virtual camera which will be sat sort of somewhere over here, and we're filming that perspective there. And it's essentially taking like, a, you know, the 360 degree um, angle, and you've, if you've got the scene up here, it will say, okay, well, based on my camera position here, I need to film up there and get that uh, angle. It's the sky of that image. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So it's the same, it's the same scene, basically, and you just, like, there's a different view into that same scene, basically. Yeah, basically. So um, when you set up, like, a, a disguise project, um, and you have, you know, say, 10 or, you know, three or four scenes that you're um, working with that day, um, what we do is you, you know, you preload them all up so they're running on our, um, on the render nodes, um, and then we only kind of, so you can have lots of different scenes running, um, but then we only request them to start rendering when we're asking for, you know, the, the, um, the frames to be put onto the, onto the screen. So if you've got like 10 Unreal Engine projects open, um, that's not creating any kind of extra overhead because you're only requesting frames um, when you need that specific scene. But it means that because they're all preloaded, it's very quick to jump around and jump into different scenes and, you know, doesn't create any um, hiccups when you're producing on set. Yeah, so we have the system of compositing after the fact. So obviously we've got like this sort of plate system. So um, you'd have like the, the back plate, which is what we get rendered to the LED screen. You've got the film plate of um, people who are sort of stood in the middle, and then we can do AR overlays on top of that. Um, so you can have, that's particularly used in broadcast quite a lot. So for instance, if you've got um, sports broadcasting, you might have like a, a virtual sort of studio behind you, and then you've got sports graphics and various like player profiles that would be appearing in front of the, of the presenters on stage and, and things like that. So um, yeah, there's lots of flexibility. There's lots of things you can do with it. Um, yeah, I re recommend people coming and having a play around with it and, and then checking it out. Um, I just think, think it's much better to actually get some hands-on um, experience with these sorts of things and, and play around with it and get a better sense of um, how, things, how things work. And, yeah. Cool, awesome, thanks guys. Thank Cheers. you. Well, uh, that were the input lectures uh, for the morning. And uh, I want to say a very uh, warm thank you to everybody involved, but in particular to these guys who uh, also enabled us to you know, get hands-on and evaluate the system here in, in our studio. And um, it means a lot to us. Thanks a lot to everybody. Of course, yeah. invitation open to come to London, of course, to our office. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's a great uh, starting point to for 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 a short break before we go into demos and experiences. So we'll clean up the chairs and then we have space for delirious departures. We have residentials, we are, we have being. Um, and uh, we can also take a look at the disguise system and maybe get the camera into the volume to be tracked for those that want to have hands on. So be back in, uh, I think we said 90 minutes, Alex, right? Yeah, 90 minutes, one and a half hour. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's great to be here. Great time to be in XR, yeah. <laughs>